Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9 is where we're at. If you are new to our church, uh, we go through the Bible. We've been kind of tracking through the Gospel of Matthew together, and we've been taking it in chunks, and we're doing a series called The King's Miracles, and we're covering Matthew chapters 8 and 9. And so where we left it off last week was Matthew chapter 9 and verse 14. And today... I want to talk about joy in the Lord and rejoicing in the Lord and living a life of rejoicing in the Lord. Doesn't that sound good? That is something I need to hear, and uh, I hopefully this will encourage you today. Matthew chapter 9, let me read the text today, verses 14 and following. What I want you to note in this text, I want you to note the theme of a wedding. The theme of a wedding. Is there any happier occasion than a wedding? Absolutely not. And that's what we have here in Matthew chapter 9, verse 14. Let me read it. It says, Then the disciples of John came to him, that's Jesus, they come to Jesus, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts on a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved. Now, beloved, what we have here this morning is we have kind of a mini parable. It's a mini parable. And a parable, I mean, the most popular way to describe a parable is a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And the parable that Jesus gives here is of a wedding. What do we have at a wedding? We got the bridegroom, the bridegroom coming for the bride. This is a joyous occasion, especially in the Jewish culture of Jesus' day. Oftentimes the bridegroom would leave his parents' house and village and he would go at night and he would walk ritualistically to the village of his bride and the village of the bride and the home of the bride would be waiting outside and all the bridesmaid would be waiting for him and he would come to her and they would they would just be celebrating he would walk in he's like I've come to get you baby can I get an amen that's exactly how they said it back then I know it's in the Greek so you got a bridegroom that's the key to a wedding is the bridegroom coming to get the bride The second thing that you have at weddings is clothes without patches. Can I get an amen? There's no patches in wedding clothes, just like there's no crying in baseball. There's no patches in wedding clothes. You got clothes that are whole, that are beautiful, that are complete. And then the third thing you have at any great wedding is wine, either non-alcoholic or alcoholic. If it's alcoholic, in moderation. Can I get a hallelujah? These are the three things of a wedding. We have ourselves a parable, the joy of a wedding, a bridegroom, good clothes, and good wine. And Jesus is saying, when you follow me, when you experience me, the experience is the joy of a wedding. Following Jesus is a wedding feast and not a funeral. Following Jesus is is about the freedom of the bridegroom who's come to save us and to redeem us. What we have here is an earthly story with heavenly meaning. The heavenly meaning is joy in Jesus Christ. Jesus' goal for our lives is our joy. In fact, one of my favorite things that Jesus ever said, and this really struck me, especially early on in my discipleship, but Jesus said in John chapter 15 and verse 11, he said, these things have I spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full, that your life in Christ would be like that great picture of a village having the celebration of a wedding. The Apostle Paul said in 
Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Everybody say always. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Jesus and a relationship with Jesus and knowing Jesus is a relationship calculated to ignite joy in our life. And not only that, to give us a foundation to rejoice always, even in the worst of times we have joy even in Christ. And we ask ourselves, well, what is joy? What is biblical joy? Biblical joy is the inward confidence and contentment that God is in control and that God is for me. Joy is the inward confidence that Jesus has saved me and that Jesus is on the throne and that Jesus is working all things out for my good. Joy is located in the person and in the work of Jesus and gives us confidence and contentment. So when, Jesus, or when Paul says, rejoice in the Lord, always rejoice, he's saying practice your confidence and your contentment in the person and the work of Jesus. And if our joy is located in Jesus, then it is protected against suffering in this world and it is protected from a malcontented spirit in this world. What is Jesus saying here? Jesus is saying, man, when you're with me and when I'm in your presence, it is like a wedding feast. Rejoice in the Lord. Tabernacle Church, I want you to be revived today in rejoicing in the Lord. I want you to purpose afresh in your life this week to say, you know what? I'm going to choose joy in Jesus and not misery in this world. I'm going to rejoice always in Jesus Christ. Now, by way of introduction, let me just say there are two enemies to our joy in Jesus Christ. One of them is indicated here in this text. The ultimate enemy against our joy in Jesus Christ is something we call legalism. We see legalism in verse 14. In fact, we've seen legalism already with the Pharisees questioning Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners, which we looked at last week. But we also see legalism in the disciples of John, and they're more well-intended, but even well-intentioned legalism is bad legalism. Can I get an amen? The text says here in verse 14, Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And in the Greek, it says, Why do we and the Pharisees fast a lot? Everybody say a lot. I mean, we're fasting all the time for God. We're starving to death in the name of Jesus. We are depriving our body for spiritual enlightenment. Here we are, and we're fasting all the time, and we're denying ourselves all the time, and you're always going to weddings. Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast now? Beloved, what is legalism? What is legalism? Everybody look up here. What is legalism? Legalism is two things. Legalism is looking to the law of God to save you through your own performance of the law of God. So you look at the Ten Commandments, and legalism says you can accomplish the Ten Commandments in your own strength, and make yourself right with God through your own merit and your own work. So it looks to the law of God as a mediator between you and God, and the law, the Torah, found in the Torah, becomes the one mediator between man and God, and you got to accomplish that mediator in order to be made right with God. This is legalism. But legalism not only is looking to the law of God to accomplish your salvation, legalism then adds rules to the law of God. Everybody say adds. So if, if the law of God is your way to heaven, then you better create some extra rules to keep the rules of God to guarantee that you can be righteous in your own strength. Does that make sense? 
Okay, let me make sure. You got the law of God. And you say, I got to accomplish the Ten Commandments in order to go to heaven. I got to be religious enough. I've got the Ten Commandments. Well, in order to guarantee I keep the Ten Commandments, I better add my own little rules to keep the Ten Commandments in order to go to heaven. That is legalism. In this situation of verse 14, when it says the disciples of John said, why do we and the Pharisees fast? What you got to realize is that the Pharisees had created all these fasting rules, everybody say rules, to keep the law of God. So they fasted at least twice a week. Every Monday and every Thursday, Pharisees fasted and did not eat. They thought, this is going to help me. This is extra rules, non-biblical rules, to keep the rule of the Bible. That's legalism. Now, guess how many times God commanded his people to fast in the Old Testament? One time. Fasting is prescribed one time in the Old Testament by God, like you are to fast and not eat. And that was for the Day of Atonement. That's the only time that the Jewish people are commanded anywhere in the Old Testament to fast. Once a year, Day of Atonement. Well, that's the law of God. And the Pharisees said, that's not enough. I got to add fasting on Monday and Thursday every week of the whole year in order to keep the fasting law of God, in order to guarantee that I'm making myself right with God. Now you're like, well, dude, I'm not tempted by fasting laws at all. Can I get a hallelujah? I mean, I'm just looking out here. And you look beautiful. You look like champions today. But we Americans are not exactly uh, fasting all the time. But the principle is always there. We're fairly convinced that if we create our own rules and our own regulations, maybe we can make ourselves impressive enough to God. In the old days, in evangelical circles, we didn't go to the movie theater. In the old days, we came up with rules for no drinking. In the old days, we came up with rules for no chewing. In the old days, we came up with rules with no going with girls that are chewing. Can I get an amen? <laughs> that is not godly. That will keep you from God. Do not date the girl that smokes a cigar. Can I get a hallelujah? And if you don't date the wrong people, then you'll be more godly. You'll be more religious. And if you're more religious, God will approve you. And you just might make it to heaven. Legalism is one of the greatest enemies to the gospel of Jesus Christ known to man. And it makes for mean people, cruel people. It creates self-righteous people. All too often, even in my own life, I've gotten self-righteous at times. And so have you. And we know what self-righteousness does. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Choose joy this week. And the way that you choose joy is you got to get rid of legalism. It is an enemy to your joy in the complete work of Jesus Christ. But the second enemy to joy, which is not alluded to in this text except for in principle, is not legalism but license. Everybody say license. It's the very opposite of legalism, isn't it? Ah. License, we just come up with our own rules. We don't even care if our own rules match the Bible or not. We're just our own God. We're just going to do whatever we want to do. I'm going to create my own salvation. I'm going to define my own life. I'm going to put together the apparatus and the system of my own salvation license. Oftentimes in our world, and certainly in my life, we, we live with two inconsistent ideas in our worldviews, and we walk according to our own rules, and we define our life how we want to define it. We define our relationships the way we want to define it. In principle, license has the same problem of legalism, which is, I don't need God to save me. 
Legalism is saying, I don't need you, God, to save me. I will achieve my salvation. You just wait, God, for me to do your law. I'm going to do it right. And license says, God, I don't need you to save me. I'm going to create my own lifestyle and my own life. And so legalism and license are strange bedfellows because they both come to our heart and say, you don't need the presence of Jesus in your life. You don't need the bridegroom to come and get you from your village. You don't need him to come and rescue you 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 can rescue yourself I reckon that you and I are far more tempted by license than legalism rejoicing in the Lord you must get rid of these two enemies legalism and license and you must replace legalism and license with joy in the presence of Jesus so that being said, what we can do is we can take this parable and we can look at the three things of a wedding. A bridegroom, clothes without patches, and good wine. And we can say, okay, I don't want to be legalistic and I don't want to be in license. How can I avoid both of those errors and walk in the joy of Jesus Christ this week? The first thing is the bridegroom of Jesus Let's look at that. He says here in verse 15, Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast. We see that wedding guests can't mourn when the bridegroom has come. You can't be crying and mourning and you can't be fasting when the bridegroom comes. You can't be fasting and mourning when you're at a wedding. A wedding is a time for celebration. Here's the bridegroom. He says the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them. This is an allusion to the cross of Jesus, of course, when mourning will be appropriate, him dying on the cross. Then they will fast, but of course he's risen from the dead and now, by the Holy Spirit, He is present with us. So, what is the way to make sure that we are rejoicing in the Lord always this week? The first thing is, is that you want to walk in relationship over ritualism. Choose relationship with Jesus over ritualism. It's clear here in verse 14, the Pharisees and the disciples of John, what's happening is, is they are thinking, oh, this is great that Jesus is here and he's doing these miracles and people are getting healed and all these great things are happening. But we still have to keep up with our rituals. Like the rituals are really important. We got to still fast on Mondays and Thursdays. And what's happening is, is that rituals are becoming preeminent over the person of Jesus and over a relationship with Jesus. And Jesus says, no, man, you have to choose relationship over ritualism. I'm the bridegroom. I have come. I am God with you. Matthew describes Jesus as Emmanuel, God with us. In fact, I believe that Jesus is alluding to a prophecy about God Himself that He said He Himself, God, would become our bridegroom. In the Old Testament prophet book, it's a little itty-bitty book. If you can turn there under two minutes, you are the most spiritual person in the whole church right now today. But Hosea chapter 2, verses 19 and following, listen to what God says and how He describes Himself as the bridegroom. It says here, and I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. And in that day I will answer, declares the Lord. I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth. And the earth shall answer the grain and the wine and the oil. And they shall answer Jezreel. And I will sow her for myself in the land, and I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. 
When Jesus says here in Matthew chapter 9, verse 15, the days will come when the bridegroom is taken, and he compares himself to the bridegroom, is he not declaring himself to be Yahweh, who is the bridegroom of his people? Is not Jesus declaring himself to be divine? And is this not the point of the Gospel of Matthew in the miracles, in the teaching, that Jesus is truly man, but He is truly God. And when you have Jesus in your life, you have the one God of the whole universe. That's why Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. Why is that? Because Jesus is Lord. And the Holy Spirit guarantees that Jesus is always with us. We have Emmanuel, God with us, all the time. This is the great gift of Christmas and the Advent. Jesus has come and brought God into our life. That means that we can have a relationship with Jesus that becomes preeminent over our rituals and our routines. Jesus is saying, and Matthew is saying, that he is God. No doubt, beloved, in the paragraph, he is truly man. But in the sentences, Jesus is God. He is with us. Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? Can the wedding guests mourn as long as God is with them? We can always choose joy because God is always with us in Jesus Christ. So, what's that mean? It means that we must choose relationship over ritualism. Now, Rituals are important. Routines are important. For example, today we're going to do a ritual today. We're going to take communion. And everybody here who calls on Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is going to be welcome to one of the best rituals that we have in all of church, which is to take communion, to eat bread and to drink grape juice in memory of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. That is a ritual for sure. But what I'm saying is is that the ritual cannot be the master of your life. It must be the servant of your relationship with Jesus Christ. You must practice the presence of Jesus, not the absence of Jesus in all of your spiritual routines. It's ritualism, not rituals that we're attacking. For example, every... Believers should have the routine of reading the Word of God every day, but it can't be ritualistic. It has to be relationally. I have the routine of reading the Bible every day, but I'm doing it in relationship with Jesus. When I read the Word of Jesus Christ, I am saying, Jesus, you are with me right now. You are speaking to me. I'm reading this to hear from you in relationship. It's not just something I check off my list. Can I get an amen? It's not like, oh, you know, well, I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to get my two chapters. Done. That's ritualism. Ritualism is, yeah, man, I read 10 chapters of the Bible for 30 days straight. Done. Same thing with prayer. I mean, you know, I can fall into the routine of like, yeah, man, I pray every day. But am I really talking to God or am I just getting it checked off the list? Is it a relationship or is it just a ritual in a routine? I hope that you have the ritual and the routine of coming to church every week. Can I get a hallelujah? And invite others into that routine. But when we come to church, we have to check our heart at the, at the door and say, Lord, I'm coming to church. I'm doing something I do every single week. But help me, Holy Spirit, to not just be a routine or a ritual. Help me to be open to what you have to say to me at church today. I hope that you have as your routine and a ritual to show up on Wednesday night to talk about the Apostles' Creed. But let us not come on Wednesday nights and just learn a creed, just to learn a creed, to be educated. Let us learn the creed to say, my transformation comes in what I believe, and I want what I believe to be a part of my everyday life. The problem with John, John's disciples, is they go, well, I mean, we've always, we've always, we've always fasted on Monday, and we've always fasted on Thursday. And you're eating all the time like, Jesus, how are you keeping the weight off, man? And Jesus is like, dude, 
This is a relationship. This is not about rules and, ru and routines and rituals just for the sake of rituals. This is about a relationship. Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? We are not interested in religiosity. We are not interested in just being religious people. We want a relationship with Jesus. And there are so many people in churches around the world who go to church every day and they don't know Jesus. They know about God. They know things about the Bible. But they are not united in a relationship with Jesus. How do we rejoice in the Lord all the time? We choose relationship over ritualism. The second thing, not only does he talk about the bridegroom, but he talks about the clothes. Now watch this about the clothes, verse 16. He says, no one puts a piece of, <clears throat> no one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the path tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. Now, so the first, how do I rejoice in the Lord? Well, I choose relationship over ritualism. The second thing is I choose whole Christianity over partial Christianity. Verse 16 talks about taking <clears throat> a patch and sewing it on to an old garment. Now, I am old enough to remember. I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember this, but I am old enough to remember that when I created holes in my jeans, how many of y'all know what I'm about to talk about? <clears throat> Kids today, they're so spoiled. Can I get an amen? amen? They don't know what life is, man. You haven't lived until your mama has put a patch on a hole in your jeans and sent you off to school with the fake polo shirt where she sewed on a little polo on the shirt <laughs> and said, and I, oh, but the kids are like, don't go to school. So you, you take that patch and you put it over the hole in your jeans. Jesus is talking about a patch job. It's like no one, no one does this. No one, especially for a wedding, you don't wear patch clothes to a wedding. What happens if you put a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment? Obviously, it's not elastic. It's, it's stiff and the used materials more elastic and it pulls apart and destroys both the patch and the cloth. And Jesus is saying, listen, the message I came and the message I come with is not a message that you can patch on to your old religion. You can't patch me on to your old routines and your old fasting rules and your old legalism. You can't patch me on to old world views. We're about to preach now. It's like, you want joy in the Lord? Let me tell you something. You want joy in God. I mean, you want to rejoice in God. You want to have seasons of renewal. Then, beloved, replace partial, everybody say partial, partial Christianity with total Christianity. Like, if you want one part of Jesus, you're going to have to take the whole thing. Can I get an amen? And what religion does and what irreligion does is it tries to create a patch job religion. It takes the parts it likes and says, I'll take this and I'll patch Jesus onto this thing that I really like. And then together I will have my own religion. And Jesus is like, no, 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 man. Listen, you're going to have to take off all your old clothes. Can I get an amen? And put on a whole new set of clothes. I came to give you a total message, not a partial message. Many Christians, especially in our culture, we are very tempted. I've been tempted. You've been tempted, given the worldviews that are so inconsistent with biblical theology or, or a Christian worldview. We are tempted to patch on Christianity and still hold on to something of the world. <clears throat> There's no joy in that. Jesus says, man, you want joy? Put on the whole cloth that I have for you. And when Jesus came into this world, he didn't come to give us partial salvation, but total salvation. When Jesus came to give us redemption, he didn't give us partial redemption, but total redemption. In 
In fact, often the Bible uses the visual of clothes and wedding clothes to describe that when we believe in Jesus, we are covered in the full righteousness of Jesus himself. Listen to this prophecy from Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 10. Jesus came to give us total salvation, not partial salvation. He came to do the whole thing. He is the whole package. Isaiah 61 verse 10 says this in prophecy. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God, for He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. That is a whole salvation. When you believe in Jesus, He is your complete righteousness before God. The Apostle Paul talks about this whole salvation in Jesus in Romans chapter 3, verse 22, where the Apostle Paul says, The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. What that's saying is, is that is saying that when you believe in Jesus, whether you're a girl or a boy, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, whether you're from a, across the world and speak one language or you're across the other part of the world and speak another language, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you have the righteousness of God by faith alone. You are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ by faith. And finally, as one more example, Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 9, Paul says, I want to be found in Him not having a righteousness of my own. I'm done with the patch job religion. I'm done with the patch job legalism. I'm done with the patch job license and living like the world lives and believing what the world lives. No, no, no. I don't want a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. I want a righteousness that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on on faith in other words what we believe at the tabernacle and what i preach all the time happily because i'm not ashamed of the gospel it is the power of god for salvation for everyone who believes when you believe in jesus you are covered in the robes of the righteousness of jesus christ and when god sees you he sees the righteousness of jesus That is a total, radical salvation. That's not partial. That is total. There's no patches to add to that. There's no other worldview to add to that identity. That's why Jesus says back in Matthew chapter 9, verse 16, you're trying to patch together religion when I brought you the whole package. You see, practically, it works out like this. If... If I have the total righteousness of Jesus, why am I going to the world to save me? Watch me now. If I am righteous, totally righteous, with God because of Jesus, and I am complete and whole in Him, then why am I going to the world and saying, yeah, but I need this little patch, and I need this little thing, and I need this little lifestyle, and I need this little addiction, and I need this little entertainment to get my self-esteem. I don't need self-esteem from the world or from religion. Why? Because I am covered in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is saying, walk in that wholeness. Walk in that whole Christianity. Stop walking in a partial salvation. Walk in a whole salvation. I am complete in Jesus. You know... I can't remember where it's at right now because I'm a terrible pastor. <laughs> Holy Spirit, reveal to me the verse. Well, you'll have to Google it. But there's those verses where it's like, don't defile the righteousness of Jesus in your life. I mean, if you're at a wedding and you've got clothes without patches, can I get an amen? You're not going to go, hey, let's go hang out in the pig pen. 
You're not going to go in your wedding dress or if you're a dude in your tuxedo and say, I'm going to go play in the mud in these clothes. No, no. When you know you've got righteous robes on, you begin to stay away from the mud. Can I get a hallelujah? And if you want joy, if you want to rejoice in the Lord this week, then choose a total Christianity over a partial Christianity. How do I rejoice in the Lord always this week? I choose relationship over ritualism. I choose total Christianity over partial Christianity. And then finally, we look at this third picture of wine. I choose my new nature over my old nature. A similar idea, but yet still so powerful in its theology and application. Look at verse 17. Neither is new wine put into old wine skins. Obviously, he's continuing this old, this new patch on old clothes. And here he says, new wine put into old wine skins. It is, if it is, the skins burst, the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wine skins. And so both are preserved. Now, I know very little about making wine. The only thing I know is historical stuff and study that I do on these verses here. But what it sounds like to me is that in the ancient world, if you wanted to ferment wine, you would put put the wine in fresh skins, animal skins. And the reason why you put it in fresh animal skins, new animal skins, is because a new animal skins is, is elastic and it's, it's kind of fleshy. It, kind of, it can kind of move and it can, it can expand because wine, when it's fermenting, it, 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 it releases gases and the gases expand the container it's in. But once those animal skins have been used once, they expand, but they don't then deflate. They stay expanded and they become brittle. So if you try to put new wine and wine skins that have already been used it's brittle it's already expanded and the moment you put that wine in there and the gases begin to expand it it breaks apart you lose the wine skins and you lose the wine as well obviously jesus is comparing the old wine skins with these legalistic pharisaical rules that have been added to scripture as well as looking to the law of god to save us which The law of God can't save us. It can only tell us that we need to be saved. And he's saying, what I'm bringing to you, who I am is, I am the new wine. And you cannot put me in old containers. Now, when I used to hear the preachers preach on this passage growing up, the popular way to preach, verse 17, was to say, yeah, yeah, man, like, Like, Jesus is this new thing. And what we need to do is come up with new methods to represent the message of Jesus' salvation. So what, what we need to do is, as a church, we need to come up with some new, fresh, contemporary methods so that people will come in and get the fresh wine of Jesus because old containers can't contain the new message of Jesus Christ. But beloved, I would say here in verse 17 that the old wineskins is not church methods or how you do your ministry. The wineskins represent you and me. Old wineskins represents your life before Jesus. New wineskins represents your rebirth and being born again. And Jesus is saying, the message of the gospel cannot be contained in your old nature. You must be born again and become a new container to fully enjoy salvation. Do you see that? The first question for you is, are you an old wineskin or are you a new wineskin? Have you been born again? How do I know if I've been born again? How do I know if I've experienced spiritual rebirth? You are willing to believe in Jesus Christ and call Him Lord. If you are willing to call Jesus Lord and follow Him, you're like, Jesus died for me, Jesus has been risen for me, then you are a new wineskin. Can I get a praise? 
And you can contain the life of Jesus because you have a heart for Jesus. But the principle is as timeless as people themselves. People will never believe a new message until they become new people. You will not change your worldview unless you change your perspective. You have to have a new heart and a new mind in order to love the things that Jesus loves. You must be born again. This is tapping into a view of history and humanity that is distinctive to the Bible. And the view of history, according to the Bible, is there is the old age, everybody say old age, and there is the new age, everybody say new age. There is the kingdom of man, everybody say man. There is the kingdom of God, everybody say God. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, through Jesus, the kingdom of man, the old age has been invaded by the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ. Amen? He has come into a world of fallenness and Satan and demons and sinful humanity. He's brought a new age of the kingdom and he's invaded this world. And when we believed in Jesus, we now have access to the new age of the kingdom of God as we live out our life in the old age of this world. There's an overlap between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world today. There's an overlap. So what we say is that the kingdom is already, but not yet. It's already come and been inaugurated in the person of Jesus. But it's not fully here yet. He hasn't fully consummated and removed the old age. That means that we live in a world of tension. Everybody say tension. And the tension is between the old age and the new age. The tension is between the kingdom of man and the kingdom of God. Now that same view of history is the same truth of your own heart. Because when you're born again, there is a tension, everybody say tension, between the flesh and the spirit. Watch me now. I know, I know it's getting late. We're almost done, beloved. Watch this. There's a part of me that still loves that old age. And I'm attracted to it. And I come under the influence of powers of darkness. But because I'm born again and I'm a new wineskin, I have the Holy Spirit in me. And there's a part of me that loves the Spirit. This tension will exist in my life until I die or Jesus comes back again. And what Jesus is telling us to do is to tap into our new nature over and against our old nature this week. You want to rejoice in the Lord always this week? You're like, I'm going to choose joy in Jesus this week. Listen, you've got to, you've got to starve the old flesh. Can I get an amen? And you've got to feed that part of you that is born again. Jesus is saying, you've got to be and remember that you are fresh wineskins. You are containers of my love and my truth. You are containers of my life and we have to fight we've got to fight everybody say fight you got to fight for your new life you got to fight to keep yourself grounded in who you are in Christ, to keep yourself grounded in your new nature. you got to fight to starve the flesh and to feed the Spirit. you got to fight to bear the fruit of the Spirit. What is the fruit of the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. That is the person you are in Jesus. That is your new nature. That is what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life. We're not fighting to earn our salvation. Jesus has done that for us. We're fighting to walk in our salvation. We're not running the race to earn salvation. We're running the race to live out our salvation. Paul said at the end of his life, I fought the good life of faith. I have finished my race. 
I lived a life where I fought to live in the newness that I have in Jesus Christ. If you want to choose joy over despair, listen to me, you've got to choose your new nature over your old nature. J.I. Packer, in his book, Knowing God, said, Knowing God is a relationship calculated to thrill the heart. And I believe you can have a thrilling relationship with God. How do you have a thrilling relationship with God? Listen, choose relationship over ritualism, right? Choose, listen, choose, what was the second one? I'm forgetting the second one. Choose total Christianity over partial Christianity. Whoa, that was close. And listen, choose your new nature over your old nature this week. Rejoice in the Lord always this week. Let us pray.